Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so thanks for the intro, um, Sachi. And I'm glad to be here and talk to you about uh, machine learning model interpretability. Um, so as I know in the past few lectures, you've um, sort of introduced the mechanics of machine learning models. So um, from simple feed forward MLP neural networks to RNNs, recurrent neural networks that are used on sequences, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, which we'll look closely at today, um, used for images and other types of data, and then backpropagation, how do we actually train networks given um, some set of labeled training data. And so uh, in doing this, you've built these models that are extremely large. So unlike simple linear models that might have you know, dozens or hundreds of parameters that then you can just immediately read off the weights and have some sort of idea of how they're working, with these models, you could have tens or hundreds of millions of parameters. And so it becomes impossible just to look at the actual weights that have been learned and gain some sort of understanding of how the model is uh, operating. So today, the goal is to introduce you to a series of tools um, that are commonly used uh, to actually look inside these models, understand what they've learned, and how they uh, can be used to explain certain decisions, um, to sort of break open the black boxes, as, as people say, of these machine learning models. Um, I also just want to point out that there is no right or wrong way to uh, interpret machine learning models. Um, and so there are a diverse range of tools that have been built up. And also, this is actually a still very active area of research and an open problem. Um, to continue to improve and build new methods for understanding models and model behavior. Um, so at a high level, um, we're going to talk about different types of interpretability methods, um, the first of which are black box uh, methods, which uh, look from outside of the model. So that means you can't really look inside at the specific weights. You can just query the model on a particular example and observe its prediction. In contrast, white box methods enable us to look inside. So we can actually study, for example, the convolutional uh, filters and what they have learned, as we'll see in just a moment. Separately, we have input dependent or input independent explanations or interpretations. And the idea here is that uh, input dependent interpretations say, OK, you want to explain the prediction on a particular input. So why did the model predict dog on this particular image? What, what, what was it about the image that enabled the model to do that? Input independent interpretations usually try to just generally show what the model has learned. Um, and that's going to be our first example in a moment. But that don't require you to look at a specific image. You just sort of take the model itself and try to extract some idea of what it's learned from the model directly without any particular examples. Um, and so I want to motivate this a little bit for the interpret interpretability problem. So why is this important? The models are highly accurate. They can get 90, you know, 9% accuracy on some task. Why do we actually care how it's operating? Um, so this might be hard to see here. There are some blue pixels here. I don't know if you can see. Is this visible? Yeah, well, it's okay if not. There's a small set of blue pixels that are shown here. Um, the rest of the image is completely black. And so this is an image that um, I'd like to sort of know, OK, what are we looking at? Because I'm about to tell you that we can put this image into a state-of-the-art model, and it's going to predict some class with very high accuracy. Um, thanks. Yeah, so now maybe you can see those set of blue pixels here. There's also a few lighter pixels on the bottom. But the rest of the image has been completely masked out, so it's just all black. Um, so does anyone have any guesses if you don't have my slides up um, what this is? Sky, OK. What is it? Animal. Animal, OK, could be. OK, well, um, obviously, as you can see, this is a traffic light. Um, and so yeah, the, the observation of a sky is interesting because that there actually was a sky up there um, in the original image. Here's the original image. Um, it's just been normalized about 0, so that's why it's a little bit darker. But you can see there is a traffic light. So the idea is if you take this image here and put it into a state-of-the-art Inception ResNet V2 trained on ImageNet, which is probably the most popular image classification data set, um, it predicts traffic light with very high accuracy. Um, and on the right, we've derived a, a smaller version of that image where we've kept only a, a subset of the pixels, very small number of them. The rest of them are, are replaced with black pixels. In the middle, I'm showing you which uh, the red pixels are indicating that that's a pixel that we keep. And then everything else is filtered out. And then we have the image on the right. But then it suffices to take this image on the right, put it back into that model, and it predicts traffic light again with 90% confidence. And so there's 90% probability in a traffic light. There's 1,000 possible classes. And it thinks it's a traffic light. So uh, 
as you can probably imagine, this is highly concerning for, um, for example, possibly deploying this on an, uh, on an autonomous vehicle um, because it is not looking at the traffic at all. And for some reason, there exists this set of features that enables it to think it's a traffic light. Um, so we can probably assume that this isn't really a, a good, robust model that might be safe to deploy. And the methods that are used to extract images like this are based on uh, one of the met methods that I'm going to show you today. Um, so I'm just trying to explain, you know, here's a, a good use case of um, why interpretability is particularly important, especially as you're deploying machine learning models in high stakes applications. Feel free to interrupt me with any questions at any point um, as well, please. Thanks. Um, so as we said before, uh, deep learning models have been deployed in all sorts of applications, very, very high accuracy. Um, but in turn, there's sort of a trade-off between high accuracy and interpretability, um, where maybe we can train separately an interpretable model, but where the accuracy is much lower. And so there's sort of this implicit trade-off happening between high accuracy and better interpretability, um, which might be fine, but as we said, in certain applications, for example, machine learning models are used now to screen loan applicants, to predict repeat criminal offenders, medical diagnoses, autonomous vehicles, and other applications as well. And so in all these cases, it's very important that we can understand how the models are reaching their decisions. In fact, recently there's been a number of laws passed in various jurisdictions that are actually requiring that if you deploy a machine learning model, you have some ability to interpret how actually it's making decisions to avoid these possible issues. As we saw with the traffic light example, we could use interpretability to understand how a model is failing. And then possibly with that insight that we gained, improve the model architecture or training or something in some way to make the model more robust. And finally, relevant to this class uh, in a number of ways is how we can use interpretability for scientific applications where uh, maybe we have some experimental data, we train a machine learning model, we can, can interpret that hopefully accurate machine learning model where the interpretations give us insight into the underlying scientific principles that govern how that experimental data originated in the first place. So we're using the machine learning model and the interpretation as a proxy for gaining insight into the underlying, say, biology. So many different use cases for um, interpretability methods. So the first set of methods we're going to talk about, as we said before, are white box methods, where now we have access to the internals of the model. If we want to, we can look at any of the weights. We can run gradient calculations. We can do whatever we want just to try to understand what's happening. Um, and the first method is going to be looking at convolutional filters. So if you remember, this is just a standard convolutional uh, neural network. So um, here we have an input image. It's run through a series of convolutional layers. Um, there are pooling layers and then further convolutional layers and repeat as many times as the architecture dictates. And finally, those are all joined into a fully connected layer. And at the end, you output a probability distribution over the possible classes. Um, and now in particular, we're gonna be focused on, okay, well, what's actually happening as we slide these convolutional kernels over the image? What are those actually doing mathematically um, and intuitively to turn the image into some sort of vector representation that then gives us an accurate way to, to predict what the image contained. What do those filters look like? Um, just to recap here, this is AlexNet, which is a, a particular um, pretty popular um, convolutional neural network. On the right, I'm just showing a quick animation of what's happening at uh, each one of these you know, sort of subsquares as you move the, the convolutional filter over. So just to recap, we have an image here or some input, which is four by four, say it's the blue thing. Uh, we have a convolutional filter, which just contains, in this case, um, three by three or nine weights. That's sliding over the image in all possible positions. At each one of those, we convolve the filter with the image. So we just multiply and then add up those values. And at the, res at the uh, end, each one of those sort of four positions we could overlay the filter on produces this two by two. So that would be sort of this dot in the conv1 layer here that's um, from moving that kernel over the image at each position. Okay, and then we repeat this process many times. And at each layer, there could be, you know, dozens or hundreds of different filter weights. But we're gonna look at each one of them individually. So the first thing we're gonna do is just um, print out the values of those weights. 
Um, so here what we've done is we've said, okay, well, let's just, let's just look at the values of these, say, nine numbers in this case, um, project them back up to the image space. What do they look like? And it turns out that they look something like this. So this is the AlexNet architecture that we just looked at. There's also two various residual networks that have similar observations. And um, the point that I want to make here is that um, two things. The first of which is at the first layer, what we see here are edges um, that have been learned. So these look like various edge detector patterns, maybe. And uh, if we look instead at layer three, these are sort of completely uninterpretable. Um, they're just sort of, I don't really know what we're looking at there. Um, and the phenomenon that you sort of find in general with deep learning in particular is sort of building up uh, in a hierarchical way, increasingly more complex representations. Um, so initially we have the image and maybe we just detect various edges of objects in that image. At the next layer, maybe those edges are combined into a sort of more complicated shape and so on until you get to the end of the networks. So there's this, this notion of increasingly um, complicated representations. The other thing I'll point out too is that this is actually quite interesting because again, we're just visualizing the weights of those filters. There's no sort of image here. Um, and so we see that these edges have been learned. And if you think about how we actually train the neural network, we never actually told it in any way, you should try to detect edges, right? The weights are with, with standard backpropagation training, you just initialize everything completely at random. So there's no way that we know anything about edges. And you then give it, training data and a series of training steps that update those weights. And the model actually has learned that these are sort of, uh, this is an intelligent way to represent at each level in the hierarchy, what the features are and form those features in such a way that enables the representation to be used for accurate classification, say in the image case. So it's actually quite interesting that you never told the model anything about, okay, you should learn edges. Okay. Um, in deep learning, all the features are, are sort of learned along with the models given some data. Also an interesting anecdote um, that I came across was that there was actually some uh, medical or, or, or psych um, psychology research that discovered that the visual system in animals actually has a similar property. Um, so the first layer of neurons in the visual cortex is, turns out to be sensitive to um, edges as images fall on the retina. Um, so it's also quite nice or maybe some sort of parallel between how, you know, the, the human brain works and um, how these models tend to be learning these types of representations. The next thing we're going to do is sort of look in a similar way at those filters. Um, but now we're not looking at just the values of the filters. We're going to take an image, put it into the model, and look at then the activations of each of those filters after we convolve the filter with the image. In this case, there was an image of a cat that went into, uh, I think again, an AlexNet um, ConvNet. And we're looking here at the various, uh, all of the filters that are activated in the first layer and then similarly in the fifth layer. So after we've done multiple convolutional um, steps as the model gets deeper. And again, if we look here at the first layer, maybe we can sort of see, okay, I don't have the original image here, but this sort of looks like maybe two ears on a cat. Um, I think there's another one here that you can probably make out here um, and down here. And so we can again see, okay, it's picking up edges of the object. At the fifth layer, we don't really have anything like that um, because again, the representations have become increasingly more complex and abstract. And so we can't really put any sort of meaning to what's going on. So that's sort of the point here, just seeing how the representations get more complex as we go um, through the model. Are there any questions on those two approaches um, before I go on? Okay, um, so the next thing we're going to do is say, um, well, let's just suppose we put an image into the network. At layer one, it turned out that, you know, the filter, I don't know, like this one here looks like this. This is the the value of, of the activation map after we put the image through for some filter. What if we wanted to then go in reverse and say, okay, let's just say this filter activated, you know, very strong, uh, strongly. And we wanna, we wanna project out, okay, what possible image might have gone in to make that filter um, activate in that way? So there was an architecture that was proposed called a deconvolutional net neural network. Um, that essentially can be thought of as a convolutional neural network operate, uh, operating in the reverse direction. So it takes uh, an activation map 
and it says what would be an image uh, that allows you to activate the map in that way, to understand what the, the, the weights in the map have actually learned to represent. And their approach for doing this is through um, what's called a transposed uh, convolution. So again, this is the same image we saw before. We have a three by three convolutional filter here. And we go from a four by four input into a two by two output. Mathematically, we can think about transposing the matrix that represents this convolution. And then starting with what's the two by two, that's the output of uh, the network in one direction becomes the input to the deconvolutional neural network. So we start with the two by two. We slide the transpose of this three by three filter over it. And it turns out that that produces a four by four. And so there's a bit of mathematical details going on that um, I, I don't want to get too hung up on right now. But the point is that this allows us to invert the operation of the convolution and go backwards. So we can start with uh, a particular activation map transpose the convolution that allows us to go in reverse and back out what might an image have looked like that activated the convolution in that way to gain an idea of what the, the, the convolutional filter actually represents. So then just to, to look back now at this image here, um, this is a figure from their paper where they propose these models. Um, I think uh, what's happening here is where the images on the left correspond to the, the similar um, uh, positioned image on the right side. Um, and so these dogs on the left are after you, so you, you run this dog on the right through the model, you get the activation map at say the first, or in this case, it might be the third or fourth convolutional layer. You then back that out using their deconvolution operation and you get the images on the left and you see that they're similar. Why isn't the image exactly the dog? Why, why if you back it out, don't you get the exact original image? Um, and it turns out that this backwards procedure is, is lossy in a sense. Uh, and so as you back it out, you get an approximation for the original image. And if you think about why that might be, there are various operations that are happening in the CNN, for example, max pooling, where you have maybe nine sets of weights and you only take the maximum and bring that into the next layer. And so it's just given what's in the, in the, in the deeper layer, you can't back out all of the original values but rather you get an approximation um, for those. Additionally, another reason why it's not exactly the same is if you think about how this network was trained, it's doing uh, what's called a discriminative task. Um, that is, given an image, you want to discriminate it among, say, one of an image net, 1,000 possible classes. Your goal isn't to learn, OK, maybe all pictures of dogs tend to have grass in the background or have green backgrounds, or like ships and planes might have blue sky. You don't just care what makes a ship a ship. You care what makes a ship a ship and not any of the other possible things say, that might share similar backgrounds. So the features that you actually find here are, for example, in dogs, the features that allow you to distinguish a dog from a cat. Um, and so in some sense, maybe the cat would have had a similar background, but it doesn't share, say, ears and mouth and features like that. And so this is showing us now how the model is learning to discriminate among all of the possible classes. There are completely different um, architectures where the goal is to generate uh, instead of discriminate images uh, of a particular type. But the goal of these models, how they were trained, um, was to discriminate among the, the classes. Yeah. Uh, just regarding the uh, transpose operation, that means you actually take the transpose of the weight matrix and or how that's what is what happens. Right? Yeah, th that's that's correct. Um, it's not just a three by three matrix. You can actually think about so right because you have a matrix in every right element. Yeah. And it turns out though that the weights are the same. Yeah. So the what act what this actually is is so if you think about taking this four by four um, original image you can represent that as a flattened 16 dimensional vector. The output is a four dimensional vector and then you have a matrix that maps that 16 dimensional thing into a four dimensional thing. That matrix is sparse, it's mostly zeros and the weights are also shared. Um, and then you can transpose that matrix that allows you to go from the four dimensional back to the 16. Um, if you're interested also in more details, there's one of the readings linked um, on the uh, course site. I think it's called a guide to convolutional arithmetic, and that goes into excruciating detail of uh, the mathematical operations. Um, but it, it's definitely interesting um, to think about. 
Also, uh, similarly, when you actually train a CNN, just as a separate point, um, you have to do a similar thing because how do you actually back propagate through a convolutional filter or for example, through a max pool um, where some of the weights don't actually matter? How do you actually back propagate gradients through those things? And I think you might've seen that a bit in the CNN or back prop lecture, um, but that paper also goes into um, details on that if you're interested. And one more point here from the deconv net that I'll make. Again, we see a similar thing. If we look at the, the images that yield very high activations at layer two as compared to layer four or five, and then back out uh, the deconvolutions of those, there again, we see this pattern of edges in various orientations, sort of very simplistic shapes. And as you go to higher uh, or deeper layers in the neural network, more complicated representations. So um, similar pattern that we saw before. Yeah. Uh, is the deconvolution something that you do during training or during uh, evaluation testing? It's after. Okay. Um, so the idea is um, you have a trained model and we're looking to understand it. Um, and it uses, so as you do this operation, um, the weights of the deconvolutional filter, if you will, are the same weights as those for the filter that you learned in the forward direction. It's just that you transpose the matrix, which then allows you to undo the operation, but the actual weights are the same. So the weights in activation, they have this is activation at that time, the weights are fixed on fixed. Correct. I see. Yep. How much overhead does that add to the activation? Um, so that's a great question. Um, in terms of performance of these various models, um, You'll see as we compare different ones, this one actually, so you can think about doing this in just a single backward pass, um, which actually is fairly efficient, relatively speaking. Some of the other methods you'll see require huge amounts of forward inference to the network, for example, um, to compute an interpretation. So here and in the next method, we're going to see you can do this with just a single backward pass um, through the network. Which is fairly so efficient. Traditionally, you wouldn't do a backward pass at test time, but in this case, you would. Correct. Yeah. So during just test inference, saying, "Okay, here's an image. I'd like to know the confidence." That only requires a forward pass. Um, as soon as you start asking various interpretations of the network, um, often we back propagate. The reason or sort of intuition for why I might do that is um, gradients tell us a lot about how inputs change outputs, as we're going to also see in the. Um, the immediate next uh, method that I'm going to show you. Um, so back propagation tells us about gradients and those allow us to understand how the input features affect the output. For there to be a gradient though, you would need a label for the test. So this would only work if you actually have a label data set and not if you're doing a set of inference test. Um, correct. So what you might do is, so um, well, this method in particular um, didn't require you to actually know that this was a dog. It just found that as, for example, you piped this image in, um, this filter activated uh, significantly, and then you can just run this deconvolutional operation. I mean, the next method that I'm going to show you, um, you need to take the gradients with respect to output, as I think you're, you're saying, which is exactly correct. Um, if you don't have the true label, you can use the predicted label. So um, let, me, let me switch over to the, the next method, and I think you're gonna see the, the same um, point here. Um, so these are uh, you, uh, very popular interpretations called saliency maps, also sometimes called sensitivity maps. And the idea here is that we have, in this case, I have six different images that are, that are being shown. Um, and underneath each image is, is the saliency map. And this effectively is a heat map of the gradient values. So um, let me move this. So each one of these pixels in the bottom image is showing you the gradient value of the output prediction with respect to each of those input features. Um, so in this case, back to the, the previous question, we put this image through the network. It comes out to say sailboat. We now have a function that tells us, okay, given an image, what is the probability of sailboat? Where we just take the, the output node corresponding to sailboat. We then run a backward pass through the network where we compute the gradient of the output. SC is, is the, the score of class C. So in this case, it's the probability of class being sailboat. And uh, compute the gradient with respect to the input features. 
And how do you do this? It's just the exact same as you do during training where you back propagate using the, the back propagation method, the gradients all the way back layer by layer to the input. And then we just show the, the magnitude of those gradients on a plot like this. And this now is, in some sense, intuitively tells us sort of by definition of the gradient, how much does changing each pixel change the output? Because those are pixels that are probably very important for how the model predicted um, sailboat say. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, and again here, like if you think about the efficiency of this method, uh, this was just a single backward pass, which relatively speaking, as you see, as we compare to other methods, um, is quite efficient. A single pass through a network, especially on a GPU, for instance, as you might actually do it, um, is super, super quick. And you can batch them. So just like during training, you can run a batch of say 32 or 128 or, or more images at a time. We can now compute backwards the gradients uh, with respect to all of those in a batch. And again, a single pass. So not only we can, we can actually do 100 at a time or hundreds at a time via a single backward operation, um, which is nice and parallelizable. That isn't the case with some of the other methods that we'll see. So here's um, what I think to be sort of now just a downstream application that's interesting. Um, this, this, I'm not saying this is the best way to do this particular task, but this is just an interesting sort of corollary of the sailing stamp method. So suppose we have these, these images, and on the right here, these are the saliency maps for each of those images. And if you think about the data that we had when we trained the model, all we really knew is we had the image and we had the output. We didn't know, okay, so this is a snake. We didn't know what part of the image actually contained the snake. We didn't have sort of bounding boxes or anything of that sort that told us where in the image the snake is. But we can actually use this method so we can take the values of the gradients. In this image, we're thresholding those above a certain value saying, okay, well, those are probably the most salient or the most important pixels that, that enabled the model to make this prediction. We can threshold all of them above a certain value and then throw away everything else. And now we've actually been able to do uh, what's known as an object detection task, where now we actually found, okay, well, this is our belief of where in the image the snake is. Yeah. How does this, how does this perform relative to like doing the object detection to like labeling the pixels? I don't know the numbers from this particular application. I know that when they proposed this paper, so um, this is what's known uh, as weekly supervised object detection. So if you think about machine learning, you have supervised where you have label data, unsupervised where you have no labels. This is what's called weekly supervised because you have some labels roughly, but not really for the task you're interested in. Um, so I'd expect that any supervised method where you actually originally had bounding boxes that you can train on would do better than this. Although I know that in this paper, um, which I'd encourage you to, to check out. It's actually the paper that proposed saliency maps and uh, this downstream application. And they actually found that it was competitive with, um, it was competitive on benchmark data sets for object detection. So I don't think it was state of the art, um, especially given any supervised thing, um, but it worked quite well. That was also back in 2013. So I'm sure that there are also many newer methods that have been developed as well. Um, but I think just to understand, you know, various use cases of interpretability, this was, I think, quite an interesting one. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, great. So the next method we're going to talk about um, was one that was developed uh, here at MIT actually by um, Antonio Taralba's group, uh, which works on computer vision. And this is called class activation mapping. So what they did is they made a, a small change to how the architecture of the neural network was built. And then using that new architecture, we can understand or gain in interpretability into how that model's making decisions. So the architecture is pretty much exactly the same as before. We have an image, we have a number of convolutional, layers of you know, increasing depth. And at the end, we end up with some number of, in this case, there's three, usually in practice there'll be many more, but in this figure, there are three final convolutional uh, activations. What they do is they use a technique called global average pooling, 
And what that does is it turns each one of these, there's a blue, a red, and a green, each one of these final um, activation maps into a single number by just taking an average over all of the values in that map. So for example, the entire blue map is mapped into a single number by just averaging across the entire map. Similarly for the red and the green map. So we just average each map into a single number. That gives us a dense layer here, or just a fully connected layer. And that serves as our second to last layer, which would then connect to the output layer, which is then just a distribution over all the possible classes, the final output distribution. And these weights, importantly, that connect this uh, result from average pooling with the output layer are trained with the network. So just like every other parameter in the neural network or in this side of the network, uh, a fully connected neural network, those parameters are just randomly initialized and then learned along with the entire rest of the network during training, and then they're fixed. And interestingly, you can then use those parameters to understand a particular decision. So here we have this image, which is going through the network. That image, as you put it into the network during test time, gave us these three uh, or more activation maps. Each one of those becomes averaged here. And we can use the weights that connect the average pooling layer with the output to understand and take a linear combination of the various filters. So the output, right, the probability of, uh, of Australian Terrier is W1 times this blue value, which was the average of the blue filter after we put this image in, plus W2 times the red value. And so we can take a weighted average of all of those filters, or technically a single number that was sort of an average or summary of each filter, and produce this class activation map. So let me move this back up here. And here we're showing, right, so W1 times this blue filter, W2 plus W2 times this filter, and we can just add all of those filters up and take sort of this, each of these filters is just showing us the value of that filter as this image goes in. And then the weighted combination is telling us, okay, um, how much back in the input space did each of the original pixels matter? Does that make sense? The clever thing here is that these weights are one, learned with the model, and two, are class specific. Right? Because if I were to connect to a different output node, there's a different set of weights connecting this layer to the end. So we know for each particular output, Australian Terrier in this case, this is the set of fixed weights. Then what do we take a linear combination of? It's the filters that activated as we put that image in. So the weights are class specific. The filters themselves are activated based on the image. But then together, we can take the linear combination of all of that, weighting them with those class specific weights and produce what they call the class activation map that then points to the parts of the image that were, um, according to the model, most critical for making the decision. Yeah. Are they going from feature space to the image space? Going from feature space, when they actually draw this? Yes. You're saying? Yeah, so the, these filters are then um, projected back up to the size of the image space, and then here they're just being overlaid on top of the original image. So they have to, assuming that these have gotten smaller, in size, the image is usually about 250 by 250 pixels. These might be, I don't know, 64 by 64. You just upsample them. Um, and then you can overlay those, say, with the image, which is what's shown here. And that'll just point to, you know, um, what regions of the image were sort of the hot spots for the prediction. Um, and if you, If you take a single image now, here's an image of, um, I don't know if the true label is dome, maybe it is, but as you put an, an image in, you get the probability of say a thousand different classes in ImageNet, and maybe you can take the top five of those. So here I'm saying the top five predicted classes were palace, probability 0.46, dome, probability 0.2, and so on, in decreasing probability. So those are the five most likely classes that came out from this image. We can use the class specific weights now, W1, W2 to WN, which are dependent on each of those target classes and repeat this exact same procedure. So in this case, all of these actual 
filters, the blue, the red, the green are exactly the same, but we change the weights now because we're predicting toward different classes in each of these images. And if we look at the final class activation map, for example, Palace points to the entire thing, whereas Dome actually just points to the top piece. And so that's again, telling us sort of two things. It's telling us one, if we trust the model that this method is working well for interpretation, but also that the model is doing something we hope, that if it's predicting dome, it's actually paying attention to the dome and not, for example, some other sort of correlated features that exist when dome exists in the image. It's actually paying attention to the right part of the image when it, when it makes that prediction toward the dome. Yeah. When um, we have those convolutional layers in the exact step, are we upsampling, just interpolating, or are we back convolving, like in the preview? I believe you're just upsampling them to the size of the image. Um, but I would check the details of the paper to be totally sure. But I think it's just, it's not like a deconvolutional operation or all the way back to the network. I think you're just upsampling this to the size of the image. So the, one of the main advantages of this technique would be to be able to then visualize on the input image the, what are the specific areas that the filter is activated for and the wider classification of curves. Because otherwise, what would be the difference with like a traditional, maybe more uh, deep convolution? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of the differences here compared to, for example, salience maps, it also might be able to just produce an image that looks like this with um, hotspots of um, sort of salient pixels. Um, one difference is that this model is actually built to sort of have this interpretability built into it. And so uh, you're, you're requiring the model during training to represent predictions in a way that can be decomposed like this, right? The other model, you could have taken any possible neural network as long as it's differentiable and then backpropagate inputs. It didn't matter what was actually happening inside. Here, we're actually requiring the model to uh, make predictions in a way that we can then sort of split up like this. And so uh, I don't know if they did that in this paper, but an interesting sort of thing you can think about would be, does it actually lead the model to make predictions for different reasons? So if you took a completely different architecture and you took this exact image and put it in and then looked at say the saliency map versus this, how much would they overlap? And uh, I don't know. Um, in general, I'm going to show you a few more methods too that sort of accomplish the same thing. That is, you have an attribution for sort of how important is each pixel toward the output. And all of these methods actually give you sort of different explanations. And that's sort of why there's this ongoing active research in this area because there isn't really the best way to produce um, interpretations. And also from sort of a, the research point of view, it's actually very tricky to evaluate these things because you know we we can look at this and and you know say like this is you know this looks great to us and i think actually a lot of interpretability work sort of is flawed in a way that they don't really have good techniques for evaluating the interpretation so you know this looks great to us but is that really what the model has learned i mean maybe it maybe we're just biasing toward methods that produce those, that looks good to us but that's not really what the model has learned Right? So if you think about the traffic light image that I showed you at the very beginning, if, um, I should have put it up. If you actually run some of these saliency methods on that, it actually will look like it's over the traffic light. But yet there existed this sort of weird border around the image that also enabled the model to make the prediction. So this idea of how to evaluate and compare interpretability methods is, I think, a very open problem. Um, there aren't really perfect ways to do that. Um, one more thing you can think about that I'll say is in certain cases, for example, especially in biological data where you observe data and you know, okay, it, you know, bound or not, say in some particular downstream, you know, um, binding task or something, you can actually train a model that you trust to be accurate or that has shown to be accurate in other ways, interpret it and see how often the interpretations correspond with sort of the right part of a, a sequence that's known for binding, for instance. So biology actually sometimes gives us sort of these nice uh, binary labels where then we can evaluate methods. And I'll show you some uh, method that does that later 
but it's a great question. It's, it's sort of an open problem. Yep. Um, also, this method is kind of uh, local interpret interpretability. So per individual picture that I run through, yep. because I could have a different picture that also has dome as a class, as a class and then use something entirely else to predict that. that yep. I mean, we Correct. can't just assume that it will still be used in the same area, right? So yep. it can change per picture. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, question. Are the upsampling layers included in the training? The upsampling is not included in the training. So you're saying uh, you have to upsample these to the size of the image to be able to sort of compose them over the image. And I don't believe that that's done during training. I see. So actually, with the upsampling, you would have some type of filter that you would apply on the output of the composition right before that. So I don't know if I don't know if there is I, I don't to my knowledge it's not actually a filter I think you actually just take this map and stretch it up to the size of the original image. So that's the case. Then how are you learning the weights for the class? So the weights. So um, during training you have each of these filters. They're some size, say sixty four by sixty four. Um, you then average spatially over um, that map. Um, so it turns each one of these, um, say 64 by 64, into a single number. And the weights then connect this sort of <coughs> dense layer to the output layer. So it never involved us going back out to the image space. It just said, we have this map, we average over all of it, and then we take that average that's connected by some weight to the output. So the output is a weighted combination of the averages from all of the maps. Maybe I can just review that later, but I guess my general question is, does this increase the complexity? Uh, of training or the ability to actually converge on a model, especially in the case where you don't have uh, a large number of labeled data sets? Um, I, relative to other models, I don't think that it increases the complexity. Um, and so this was trained on ImageNet where you do have a huge amount of labeled information. Um, I, don't, I don't think that this is, so I, I don't think that it's too different than other Methods where, again, you're doing some sort of eventual sort of pooling over the spatial dimension to go from a convolutional activation map to something that's just a single value, and then you take the dense layer. So I think that this is just a nice composition using global average pooling. Um, I don't think that it's any less efficient than if you did anything else. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how, I haven't seen it used in other settings where there isn't much labeled data, um, but I don't think it's too different. I think it just enables us to have this sort of nice decomposition. Yeah. Hi, Bob. I, I get the general idea when using imaging data, but I was wondering if you have examples using non imaging data, like, such as high dimensional one data. Yeah, great question. Um, I will show you a couple examples that are not image data, so some from natural language and um, some from genomic data, DNA sequences. Um, also, in the next lecture, um, uh, Professor Gifford will talk about the uh, more applications in the bio side. Um, so to sort of understand the methods, I think images are really nice because they're interpretable to us and we can actually understand what's going on. We know sort of some ground truth of what we'd like to happen, um, whereas that's harder in the, in the biological domain. Um, but yeah, you'll see a, one or two examples of that later and then definitely in the next lecture. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about quickly one more method um, and then sort of dive into the, the final method. Um, so this is a method called integrated gradients. And again, the goal here is to take an image and to map out sort of the gradient value or some importance value at every one of the input pixels. And the approach for doing that here requires us not just to take the image that we're testing or would like to explain, but also a reference point. And the goal now is not just to understand the image itself, it's to explain the difference between the model's prediction on the image and the model's prediction on the reference. So here's an example. Typically the reference or baseline input is taken to be sort of something completely uninteresting to the model. So in this case, an all black image on which the model would just sort of say, this is nothing, hopefully a uniform prediction over all the possible classes, nothing is really more probable. And here's our actual input. And the way we're going to go about explaining the prediction is by explaining the difference in 
the prediction between the actual input and the baseline input. So it sort of gives us a reference frame or a grounding for what the model's doing. And what we do is we, so in the previous work, uh, we just took the gradients of the final image, right, back to the input. What we're going to do here is take the gradients at various steps from the input to the output. So we can take all of the various steps from the baseline to the actual input. So here there's three steps shown. So it's basically just going sort of uh, a straight line from one image to the other, a straight line in this high dimensional image space. So it's becoming just increasingly brighter, if you will, um, here. We're gonna compute the gradients at all of those steps from the baseline to the actual input and then average them, which might give us a bit more of an accurate picture of how the model is predicting on the actual input compared to how it predicts on something that's not informative. So the mathematically what's happening here is you can think about this as being a path from the baseline to the actual input. And we're just gonna take a straight line path. So that is just sort of going um, from the baseline x prime to x um, just through some coefficient. So it's gonna take some part of x, some part of x prime from zero to one. And you can think about this as being a path integral over this path. At each step of that path, we're gonna compute the gradients and then average them, at least in the discrete case. The way this is actually implemented in practice is through an approximation of the integral where uh, we are going to divide it into a discrete number of steps, like 50. So instead of three, there'd be 50 images here. Um, at each one of them, compute the gradients like we saw before and then average them at the end over all 50 images. And so why are we doing this? Why is that any better than what we did before? Why don't we just take the gradients of um, you know, this image? Why do we have 49 other pieces? Um, if you think about, this is now a simple one dimensional case. So uh, in this case, we have a baseline, which is this point here. We have a uh, data point we care about. This is like the picture of the dog here. And this is the actual function between them. This red line turns out to be a, a sigmoid. Um, but if you think about, okay, well, let's just say we observe the value of the function here, which is one. And well, the gradients here are all zero. If we go to the baseline, the gradients are zero, but there's a set of interesting gradients that happen as we go from one to the other. And so by taking a path from the baseline to the point we care about, we're able to account for what happens in between and sort of average over the various gradients that happen as you go from the uninformative point to the point that, we're, that we care about. And uh, I don't show it, or actually uh, this is showing the value of the integrated gradients compared to the gradients at the image. This is the saliency map that we saw before. And we see sort of a, a sharpness in the integrated gradients values compared to just the, the original gradients that we saw before. So this is exactly the salience method we saw before on the right as a, as a baseline. And so this method they showed improved over that in terms of the quality of the explanations that are produced. There's a very similar method um, called deep lift which I think you'll see in more detail in um, the recitation. It's not gonna go into too much detail now, but it's very similar. The idea being here again, the important idea that there's this reference point or a reference activation. And what we're looking to do is explain the difference in the model's prediction on the reference, which is uninteresting, and the prediction on the actual test point, which is interesting. And again, the reference point allows us to ground sort of our understanding of, of how the model is differing on those two inputs. So again, here, uh, here's absolute gradients is what we had before. Um, this is the salient to that method. The positive um, gradient times input. This is another method we're not covering called gradient times input, where you take the gradient and multiply it back with the input. And then deep lift, again, similar here. Um, as with the, the integrated gradients example, um, better clarity in the explanation. There's also an example here, which um, I think will be described more in the next lecture um, where this is applied to some genomic data. And again, showed in this uh, deep lift paper that this method matched uh, the ground truths. This data I think was a synthetic data set 
Um, and so there was some ground truth for how that was generated. And you can look at the important uh, features. So in the image case, the more salient pixels. Here, motifs of um, DNA bases that were known to be more important actually were surfaced more by this method compared to other methods. That's a way to validate that this method is sort of improved in discovering um, ground truths. So I think you'll see this more uh, definitely in the next lecture, along with other methods that involve sequence data. There are a number of other methods, again, and also hundreds more that we're not talking about here. Um, Lime is a very popular one. I'll just briefly mention it. The idea behind the Lime is, so you have your image point that we're querying, want to explain. What we can do is say, okay, let's just randomly perturb all of the pixels in that image. And for each one of those perturbations, like very, very small perturbation, a human would never notice that the image changed at all. Let's just run that new image through the model and observe the output. We can do this a bunch of times repeatedly with just random samples of noise sort of added to the image in various ways, and then train a linear model that maps from uh, the image space to the output and around all those perturbations. So we've built a linear approximation of what the function is doing around the point by sampling sort of random noise points around the point we care about. But now we have a linear model that where we can read off the weights and it tells us how important was each one of those input pixels to changing the output. Because as we made various changes to the input features, we observed how the output changed, if at all. And now we can understand which features are most important for changing the output by fitting a linear model. Um, so that's an interesting method. There's also Shapley values, which come from game theory, um, where you measure the marginal contribution of each feature, averaged over all possible sets of ways features can be in, uh, included or excluded. Um, and then they have an efficient way to compute that. Um, but I don't want to go into detail, just to sort of highlight some other popular methods. I'll also just say um, Lime, for instance, was one of the black box methods that I mentioned at the beginning where we never had to look inside any of the weights of the model. We just took a bunch of images, we randomly perturbed them, we observed the outputs, and then we fit a new model that's sort of the explanation model through those perturbations. We never actually looked inside. So a nice aspect of that, although it's a bit more computational costly because it required many forward passes through the network, and then additionally fitting this new model with a with separate set of weights um, could be applied to any black box machine learning model. So even if it's not differentiable, for example, you could explain it using this method. So uh, I think there's one more method I want to talk about before we go on to our, our, our final um, black box method. This now is uh, going to be input independent. So if you remember, now we just go back to, OK, we have a model. We don't have any particular input that we're trying to explain, but we want to learn something about what it's learned. And the way we do that is we set up um, the following optimization problem. The objective is, so ignore this term in, in blue for a second. So just argmax over an image of um, the probability uh, toward a particular class. So SD is, as we said before, the score function for class C. So that's just the probability of a particular class. So like dumbbell, for, for instance. So given an image, S just returns the probability of that being a dumbbell, which is just a number. So now the optimization problem is we want to find the image I that maximizes the value of S. So what this is saying intuitively is, OK, just find me the, 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 the most dumbbell-like image you can possibly imagine. Um, and let's see what that looks like. <laughs> So that's what this optimization problem is framed as. How do we actually solve it? Um, well, we can go back to um, gradient ascent, where we initialize the image as something. So say all zeros or some like random image or something. And we can run the gradient updates by just taking, right, as we did before with saliency maps, we can compute the gradient of S with respect to all the pixels in the image. And then we can just keep stepping in the direction of the gradient iteratively until we settle on the image that is sort of a local maximum of you know, a dumbbell, which is shown here. And if you look at these and sort of squint a little bit, like in Husky, for example, you can sort of see like a few Huskies here, like a few faces, um, similar for Dalmatian, dumbbells, you can see a few of them. 
And so these images don't real, look realistic to us, obviously, but the interesting thing is that to the model, this is sort of the, the maximal way you can possibly activate all of the, you know, the filters or, or whatever that lead the model to believe that it's a dumbbell. And again, just gave some insight into what the model is doing or, or what it's learned. Um, I'll say now that this other term here is just like when you trained the model, um, you apply various regularizers. So here, this is just an L2 penalty, um, which penalizes the squared um, value of all of the weights, just to keep all of the weights from not getting too extreme. It turned out empirically that if they didn't have this term, what happens is the image uh, just ends up looking like complete white noise because there's no bound on what the, the possible values are. So um, just like when you train the weights of a machine learning model, you usually apply some sort of regularizer or penalty on them just to keep everything in check from getting too extreme. Um, and you do the same thing here. So now back to our first point that we've seen a few times now, we also see the same thing here where if we run this procedure, but then rather than backing out the input all the way back to the image space, let's stop at various deeper levels of the network and see, okay, well, what's the, what's the thing at you know, layer five? What could that look like that maximizes the probability of a particular class? And again, we see at lower layers in the network, so layer two, for example, which is closer to the input, the representations are more simplistic. So again, we have these sort of edges or just smaller shapes here, and they get more and more complex as we go deeper into the network because we're, we're using the features at the lower layers as building blocks and combining them into more complex representations. <coughs> I'll also just um, ask one question here because I think it's um, interesting. So we had this L2 penalty. Um, and so that allows us to find images that looks like this, but um, think about how maybe we could, let's say we wanted to generate images that looked more realistic for one reason or another. Like these clearly don't look realistic, but let's say we wanted to. So um, think about how maybe you can do that using sort of a, a framing like this. Does anyone have any ideas on how, if we wanted to make these images look more realistic, how we can dream up something that looks more realistic? Instead of L2, have some loss penalty where the image is getting penalized for not looking real. Yep, exactly. Sorry, Perfect. Yeah, excellent. Right. So we can think about adding additional regularization terms here that would encourage the image to uh, look more realistic. Now, thinking about what those might be, um, was there was actually a separate paper um, that worked on that. Um, it's one of the papers. I think it might actually be this paper. Um, where they introduce various penalties that enable the representation to look more realistic. One thing to keep in mind, of course, that as you do that, you need to make sure that they're differentiable, right? Because we actually found I that maximized this objective using gradient ascent. And so we had to be able to take the gradient of it. And so if it's some term that's not differentiable, then that breaks down. So in some sense, there's almost like an art to what sort of simplistic terms that are easily differentiable can you add that give you, um, sort of the thing you're looking for. And so in this paper, they propose, it, um, propose a few of those. Yeah. This is at like test time where you're changing the optimization properties. Is there a way that you can create that like training time so that you have more? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so the question is, can you possibly do things like this during training time? Um, and the answer is absolutely. So if you think about the exact same thing happening during training, right, you have traditionally like a cross entropy loss that tells you, okay, the true label distribution and the predicted label distribution, you want those to become closer together. Um, you often do have L2 terms or something like that that keep the weights of the model um, small. Um, you can certainly add other terms that uh, discourage the model from uh, doing things you don't want to do. So um, it's not just constrained to this type of setup, but just in general, maybe you don't want the model focused on borders or something, or maybe you don't want the model um, you know, doing something like that. You, you can think about adding terms onto the loss, but absolutely you can do that during training um, for all sorts of downstream applications to guide the model to, uh, uh, to, to focus on a particular area of the image or, or do something like that. Regularization, I think, is just, for those who haven't seen machine learning before as well, 
something that comes up all over the place. And, you know, thinking about how you can apply penalties to objectives to sort of have these nice properties comes up in, you know, many, many, many different um, scenarios. Yeah, question. Um, do you run the risk of overstating terms? Can you Yeah, good question. Um, traditionally, regularization is used to mitigate or prevent overfitting. Um, so the idea is, you know, if you didn't have this, or let's just say the case of training up a neural network just to classify images, forget explaining them for a second, you add the penalty terms usually as a way to mitigate the likelihood that it overfits. So if you think about it, if you didn't have an L2 penalty, for instance, the weights of the model can go, you know, super high or super small, positive, up to positive or negative infinity as hard as they can. With this penalty, it sort of keeps it in check. So the space of possible weights you can find is constrained in a way. And that's sort of this idea of regularization that you're constraining the capacity of the model. Um, dropout is another very popular technique um, that itself is a form of regularization. So this is one form of dropout's another. Um, there are many other, many other flavors of it as well. Um, but the idea there again is you're doing something during training that uh, forces the model hopefully to be more generalizable. In the case of dropouts, we turn out, we turn off various combinations randomly of neurons and then require the model hopefully in multiple different paths through the network to arrive at the same decision. Again, hopefully finding more robust generalizable patterns. Um, so the question, could you do this in a way that makes it overfit? Um, one thing I'll say is that maybe it's possible that you're constraining it too much that is, maybe the model is so constrained that it can't actually solve the original task, right? I mean, if, if, I, if I made lambda larger and larger and larger, the set of possible images will become smaller and smaller just because, you know, eventually as lambda gets super large, um, if you think about the two terms here, we're just going to be basically minimizing this term. We can't actually make S large, right? And so you could certainly over-regularize a model during training or here that then you can't actually do the thing you care about. So there's sort of a balance between satisfying the objective you care about and the regularization terms. And you have to balance between those. And that's why there's always usually a coefficient in front of that term to sort of weight um, how much that term influences the objective. And weights like lambda are hyperparameters. So that means you'll take, say, a validation set, repeat this multiple times with different values of that regularizer and find the one that generalizes that, that maximizes likelihood on the validation set. That's traditionally just um, forgetting, again, this sort of explanation for a second during model training, how you do that, and then find the optimal balance between the two using the data you have. Good questions. OK, so we're going to talk about one more uh, method now, which is a black box method. Um, called sufficient input subsets, where now we're going to think about the rationale in a different way. So back, similar to the line method I talked about before, this is completely black box. So um, we're not going to look inside the model at all. We're just going to take some inputs. We can perturb them however we want. We don't know anything about the function except for the value of the, the prediction that it returns. That's all we get to observe here. And we're going to think about framing um, what we call a rationale in the following way. We have an image, so here's a four from the MNIST data set. And we're going to think about subsets of the pixels here that enable the model to make the same decision as it did on the original image. So in this case, it predicted four, and we wanna find these possible subsets. These, these three images are all um, disjoint subsets that are sort of pixels from the original digit but that when you take any of these and put them back through the network, the model again predicts four. So unlike with say the gradient methods we were just looking at, there was no requirement that those actually had to allow the model to make the prediction. Here, the setup is such that we wanna find a minimal set of features. These are ind independently uh, minimal that on their own suffice for the model to make the same decision. And these are called sufficient input subsets or SIS. So um, I'll just show one more example here of how this can be useful. Again, a different setting for um, ways interpretability can help us. So these are misclassified digits. This is a five. The true label of both of these images is five. In the first place, it's misclassified as a six by a trained model. Again, the model's now trained and fixed. We're just testing it. 
On the bottom, the five was misclassified as zero. And we can compute using the method I'm about to show you, these sufficient input subsets. And we can see and now an explanation for why did the model think that this five was a six or that this five was a zero and gain insight into why it's making those errors. Similarly, you may have seen adversarial examples before where you can make sort of human imperceptible changes to an input such that the model becomes tricked. So here's a nine that's originally correct. Here it's a nine that becomes a four. And you can sort of see that it removes some of the top, but while a human might still say nine here, the model is 99% you know, sure still that this is now a, that, that it became a four. And we can compute now the sufficient input subsets of those decisions, and now again have insight into why the model made um, the correct decision, or after it was modified, the incorrect decision. So, um, how do we actually compute these subsets? So, just to set up the premise here, we assume that um, so f on x is the prediction. So previously this was called s. Here we're just calling it f. So this is just the, the the prediction toward a particular class of X. And we assume it's at least tau. So we have to require that initially the model was sufficiently confident on the image. So it wasn't just sort of this all noise image, like the all black images, it had to actually be confident. And so, you know, tau maybe we'll take to be in the MS, it's 70%. It have to be at least 70% confident in the decision. And the goal is to find these minimal subsets such that the prediction on each one of them is also at least tau. So then it has to be the case that on all the subsets that we're looking to find, the prediction is at least tau. And they're all minimal in a sense that for each one of those subsets, we can't take out any pixel. If we do, f would now be less than tau. And this idea of minimality of those subsets allows us to interpret them better, right? It would be useless if the explanation was the complete original image because that doesn't help us at all. We want to find sort of the minimal set of things that was the rationale, sort of the, the the premier evidence that enabled the model to make that prediction. And there could be multiple such pieces. So as you saw with the four example before, there were three then such pieces of evidence. And um, to actually find them, we make them disjoint. So you find one, then you say, okay, let me forget those features. Let me see if I can find another one. And you repeat this iteratively. Great, so now the question is, given, now let's say we're finding the first one, we have an image, we know the predictions above 70%, how do we actually find the first subset? And the goal here is to use a technique called backward selection. And um, I will show you, let me explain it briefly, and then I will show you a visualization of what's actually happening. So unlike the other methods we saw, in backward selection, we're going to start with all the features. We are going to independently try masking all of them and ask, okay, if we masked each one, how much does it change the output? We're gonna find the one that matters the least, so the output is still as high as possible. We're going to mask it, and then with all the remaining features, try the same thing. So of all of the n minus one features that are left, assuming there were n initially, let me try now masking all of them again. And then rinse and repeat, con constantly trying to maximize, keep the value of the function as high as possible, above 0.7, wherever it was initially, until we get to the minimum set of things that are required. The idea being at every step of this iterative algorithm, we're getting rid of the thing that matters the least. We could remove it and it wouldn't change the output at all. Now we've removed it and we do that again. And this is a greedy algorithm. So once you've removed it, it's, it's out for good. We're gonna do that till all of the features are removed and then work backwards to find the minimal set of things in the reverse order that finally gets the value of the function back above the threshold. So does that roughly make sense? Um, I'm gonna show you a video here that shows that process of backward selection happening. So here, um, we're just iteratively masking the feature. This is showing the value, so the, the function's still 100% you know, confident, and then suddenly you're gonna see it drop off. Right at the end here, the value drops. As the image there's, you know, uh, gets to the point where there's just not enough evidence less left. Interestingly, you can actually remove almost all the image and it's still confident. Going back to the traffic light issue I showed you at the beginning, um, where that's probably also a problem, especially here because the actual image is uh, a type of fish. Um, it's actually highly concerning that the first thing that's removed, that's, as we said, the least important is a fish. Um, and this again was on one of these like state-of-the-art models that you can download for ImageNet. And so this is actually an active area of our uh, research in uh, Professor Gifford's lab, trying to understand uh, how 
this can be. And, and again, going back to like the regularization question, one of the things we're trying to do is train a model with various regularizers that require it to not have, you know, 100% confidence still right here, right? Require the model to need more pixels to make a confident prediction. And we do that with various penalties we can add on to training. Um, but this is just to show you roughly what's happening, right? We're, we're, we're zeroing out pixels iteratively. The difference here, you know, so how is this different than the saliency methods or like why do we care about considering pixels together versus independently? And it could be that a pixel only matters or a feature only matters given the presence of another feature, right? And so going in this backward direction allows us to preserve any necessary pairwise interactions that have to be there for the model to make a prediction, right? It could, you know, we have no other way to tell this feature is only important because this other feature is there. So this backward selection strategy enables us to preserve those uh, interactions that are there in the full image. Yeah. So in every pixel, uh, we are doing n evaluations on the network? Correct. And at the first, yeah. So in terms of complexity, this is highly, highly complex. Um, and in fact, it doesn't even scale with the naive algorithm up to ImageNet, for example, um, because for each, for, so for a single image, at each step of backward selection, of which there are n, if there are n features, you need to do n order n evaluations. In the next step, you do n minus one, then n minus two, and so on. So it gets a little smaller, but yeah, it's like n squared evaluations. Now, at each step of that, you can think about being more efficient by parallelizing them, because you can batch on a GPU many of those in a single, single forward pass. But still, there's order n forward passes, which you know, for any images that are, I mean, MNIST is, is small. It's I think 28 by 28, um, or something of that sort. And uh, CFAR is on our data set that's 32 by 32. But ImageNet is two, you know, 250 by 250 ish, and so that just becomes 250 squared. It's just a huge number of pixels, and actually this doesn't scale at all. So there have to be um, other algorithmic improvements that you can make to speed that up. But yeah, so thinking about complexity, this is like a highly inefficient method, um, but the trade-off being we can preserve those pairwise interactions. So let me just show you some more examples of this in the final few minutes that I have. So here are a bunch of, you know, digit fours. So the row on the right is showing you again, this is the same example we had before, but now more examples of digit fours. And we can um, see again, just sort of the same idea of what these explanations look like. So those, you know, seem reasonable. The next thing we can do is say, okay, well, these are, as, as we said before, local explanations, that is explanations on a single example. So we have the trained model, we have an example, how did I make the decision? Great, we produced these sufficient input subsets. What if we were to cluster them? So what if we took a thousand fours that the model thought were you know, fours with high confidence? And for each one of those thousand, we computed all of the sufficient input subsets and then clustered all of them. That'll tell us something not local, but more global about what the model's learning. So now these are all different types of fours and we'll cluster them. And this will show us sort of all the different ways the model has learned to predict four. So, you know, there's, there's uh, in the case of um, C2, when you draw a diagonal, C5 is, is sort of just the diagonal, diagonal line. Again, going back to what we said before about discriminative models, right, we don't care about what else belongs to a four? We care how do we tell that it's a four and not another digit? And it turns out this model's learned that there aren't other digits that share this stroke here. So this clustering allows us to find different uh, sort of all, or a large set of different ways the model has found um, four. We can go one step further, which is not just clustering for a single model, well, let's say we have two models. Let's say we have a CNN, like a, a fancy convolutional network, neural network, and just a simple feed-forward NLP network, multi-layer perceptron that doesn't have any convolutions or anything fancy like that. How are they different? Well, we can both train them. Maybe they both get 98% you know, accuracy or something. How do we actually find meaningful differences between the two? And so we can, again, do this clustering procedure, but now not cluster them independently for each model, throw them all into a big pot together, cluster them, and look at the resulting clusters. If all of the resulting clusters are 50% one model, 50% the other, and that, that would tell us, okay, well then really 
all the clusters are, are you know, comprised of digits from each model, they're probably very similar in their explanations, else they would have gone into different clusters. But what we find that I'm showing you here are clusters, 100% means that 100% of the stuff in the cluster came from the CNN. These clusters came 5% and 0%, so almost entirely from the NLP. And they look very, very different, right? They're not strokes, sort of edges, and we know that CNNs are good edge detectors, so that makes sense why we see that. For NLPs, we don't really find edges, but rather we find sort of a uniform sampling of pixels, which makes sense because if we didn't have an edge detector, how would we have found those strokes, right? There's no notion of sort of spatial awareness in just sort of a, um, you know, a flat vector, which is what we use to go into the um, NLP architecture, whereas the CNN, you put in the, the you know, image um, as a square. So this can sort of tell us some differences. So CNNs, you know, spatially contiguous strokes. The NLP is based on more of a global shape. And we can now use this to understand in practice, okay, maybe one model might be better suited for a particular application. Maybe it's dangerous to rely just on strokes and you wanna use more of the entire digit to avoid um, various types of failures. So all sorts of things you can do with this kind of analysis. And again, this was completely black box, right? We can apply this to any model. Um, at these various levels, including clustering for global understanding. So as I said before, as promised, there was some, um, you can equally apply this to, this is an LSTM um, on beer reviews, again, to produce a rationale that's then a subset of a piece of text. So in this case, there's beer that has high prediction toward appearance, aroma, and palate. And so you say, okay, you know, why is, um, why is, why does it think that there's positive sentiment toward aroma? Well, the rationale contains nice nose, um, which is then telling us that the LSTM is picking up on that piece of the text to predict um, positive aroma or smell. Um, compared to, I think I wanna make one more point here. Yeah, compared to other methods, so here's integrated gradients and Lime that we talked about before. We can compare how SIS compares in terms of two different metrics. Right? With SIS, we had this idea of sufficiency so that was, we required the explanation to itself be sufficient. If we put it back into the model, the model makes the same prediction on that. With integrated gradients, there was no such requirement, right? We were just sort of computing gradient values. So in this experiment, we can take, so for each, uh, each example, we can take the rationale that comes out of SIS. We can separately, for the exact same train model, just compute the gradient values and compute the integrated gradients or the Lyme attributions under these other metrics as well and say, okay, well, let's say the SIS had, you know, we know it's minimal. Let's say it had, you know, 20 features in it. Let me take the top 20 gradient values that came out of integrated gradients and mask out everything else. And I say, are they sufficient? And it turns out that they're not. So if we constrain the size of the rationales from the other methods to be the same size as the SIS, the prediction is much smaller. In this case, the threshold for this, this task was 0.85. Um, and of course, by definition, all of the SIS predictions are above that threshold, but from the other methods, they tend to be a lot smaller. Similarly, we can say, okay, well, I have the ordering of the gradients from the gradient methods. Let me find the, um, let me find the minimal number of them just going in the reverse ordering that enables me to hit the threshold, and it turns out to be a lot longer. So the conclusion here is that in contrast, this method enables us to find subsets that are both minimal and sufficient which in some sense is important depending on what you're doing because if they're not sufficient, are they you know, valid explanations because the model isn't confident when you put them back in. Um, so another sort of dimension you can use to evaluate these kinds of things. Um, I think in the next class, there are some bio applications. Um, they're also in the slides, but I think you'll talk about this more next time. Uh, thanks.